if someone says, oh, come and see me next week and we'll have a bit more of a chat about it. OK, get a pen, get your notepad out, get your pen and say, right, what time is best for you? Put the hmm. ball back in their court. The amount of times I've had somebody say, oh, now's not a good time. Great. Tell me when is. If you're not direct, people aren't going to take you seriously. Hey guys, this is Sid Patel, your host from London Competitions. I have Wayne Baxendale here. You know, he's just uh, joined as a uh, Europe and UK brands manager for London Competitions. And I'm excited to, you know, introduce you to him. What we're going to really chat about is how you can crack an importer for UK market, how you can pitch to a UK retailer and how you can really pitch your brand to a sommelier or a bartender. So we're going to go, this one is going to be really tactical. And you know, we're going to discuss fields, objection handling, you know, a sales process. So for, for all the uh, sales reps out there, I mean, this is a good uh, next, you know, 30 to 40 minutes. So, Wayne, you know, thanks for joining me here. Thank you for having me, Sid. Um, and thank you for having me on board the team as well. Looking forward to it. Great, great. So why don't you give a little context about your journey, your experience, you know, uh, what you've been doing? So um, my wine journey, so to speak, started uh, many, many moons ago, to be honest. Um, I've always been in the uh, hospitality industry. I started off as uh, washing dishes, so to speak. I was a kitchen porter many, many years ago um, and moved down to the south of England in Kent, where I was training as a chef. I was the second chef of a very, very small family-run restaurant in a wonderful little village called Sandwich in Kent, which is just on the coast of uh, the White Cliffs. Um, and started drinking wine there, really. Never really took it any seriously. I don't think anybody did, you know, when you're in your early 20s and whatnot. Um, but always continued um, to drink wine to, to some degree. Um, and then, you know, a, a long story short, so to speak, when I um, decided to work on cruise ships, um, which was Cinco de Mayo, 5th of May, 2010. Uh, worked on ships for around about 10 years or so. Um, and everywhere we went, uh, we had a really uh, close-knit group of friends. And, you know, to, to make it our goal, everywhere we went, we always decided to drink local and eat as locally as we could. So nice. there aren't many places around, you know, the coast um, of Europe, even uh, um, as far as America, New Zealand, um, Australia, all the Tahitian islands, you know, Rangaroa, Bora Bora, all that. We've done everything, but we always made the attempt of eating and drinking local. So... For instance, when we were in Bordeaux, we went to Bordeaux, drank Bordeaux wine, ate board, uh, you know, Bordeaux food, so to speak. Um, and it was the same in, you know, Croatia, New Zealand, um, Italy, Spain, France. Everywhere we went to, we always made that attempt. And it, oh, it kind of resonated with me a little bit because every little place that we had and went to, we always gave it some meaning and gave it a story. Mm. So... You know, this by curiosity leads into what we're about to talk about. But um, after living in America for 10 years, where we, uh, we, we started in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, um, I always had the wine bug. I was working corporately with the cruise line. So, you know, your typical uh, corporate Miami lifestyle, we were running, running around and enjoying that, but always had a passion for wine, always did, and ended up working at a wonderful little wine bar called Wine Watch. And for mm -hmm. those who know it, um, you know, I'll tip my hat to them. Uh, I worked there for a little bit um, just to further my knowledge of wine. So um, I, I wasn't being paid for it due to the visa that I was working under. Uh, I was literally donating my time and I gave that time to absorbing as much information as humanly possible. And we were doing, you know, farm to table food, if you want to call it that. Um, it was the owners who were in the kitchen and, you know, work in the bar. And it was the type of place I would get told off for not having a glass of wine in my hand. Mm -hmm. So I learned and absorbed as much as I could. I'm very fortunate where my good friends, Andrew Maeve Smith, who now live in Sonoma. So we used to spend all of our time, um, you know, going up and down the Pacific Coastal Highway, um, exploring all of California as much as we could. So I've been blessed to have that foot in, you know, the, the California industry. And California wine is one of my favourites. But um, we always um, wanted to, you know, g give a story, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. which led me kind of into, you know, I wouldn't say the marketing world, but um, just giving a sense of place, you know, a sense of, um, terroir, as you know, they they coin it in the world industry, and I always say 
wine has a sense of place um, with the people who, you know, who work in the vineyards. And when you uh, experience that, it does elevate the level of wine to some a degree I think everybody should be experiencing. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's all very good sitting in a, a classroom and whatnot. But when you've experienced it, putting feet on the ground, it just elevates your whole wine experience. I got the wine bug. And it's never left me, and I don't think it ever will. To be honest with you, said it's it's a wonderful thing to to be travelled, and you know, well travelled and travel in the world. And I think everybody should be doing it. And you know, a long story short, um, I, after COVID, I ended up moving back to England, and it was a good decision for me to step out of the cruise ship industry, so to speak, and mm -hmm. really dedicate, you know, the the commitment to wine. And I did that as soon as I moved back to the to, to England. Um, and never never looked back since, to be honest with you. It's been an awesome journey. Great, great. I think, I, I believe you were in a role of a sommelier as well, so you've seen the other side. You know? Absolutely, yeah. Sorry, I skipped over that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I worked uh, in Wine Watch uh, in Fort Lauderdale. It was kind of where I got the, the some bug, so to speak. Um, I loved sharing my experiences with um, every, all the patrons who came in and... Mm -hmm. When I first moved back to to England, it was like, right, how do I get a foothold into the industry and you know tell not so much my story but everybody else's story and the story yeah. of uh, you know the world of wine. So I was the general manager of a wonderful little bar called the Arthur's of Autumn, which is nestled in between. For those who know the the food industry, it's in between Moor Hall and um, the barn on Moor Hall, and then you've got a second. Um, uh, Michelin star restaurant called Solo in Alton. So we had it, we had the responsibility of you know um, being wine led, wine focused, as well as you know having really good hospitality, which is my thing. Um, and then I decided to then leave the work at um, the barn at Moor Hall, so Michelin star restaurants. Um, I've also worked for Simon Wood, who's a Master Chef winner. Uh, 2015, I believe it was. So, you know, there aren't many places or many situations that I haven't been in where mm -hmm. um, I've experienced, you know, behind and front of house of wine, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, yeah, quite a, a quite a colourful CV, so to speak. <laughs> nice. I mean, it, it's good to, you know, travel. I I, I, mean, I pretty much do the same thing. And if I go to a place, like, I would want to have a deeper connection. And one of the great ways is by having local you know, a uh, wine or food or, you know, uh, it, even finding a local bar. It really is. Absolutely. So let's go on, you know, let's have some fun with uh, some sales processes here, right? So your version of how do you, would you approach uh, an importer or distributor, right? So let's say this overseas uh, brand, call it wine, beer or spirits, right? They're, they're trying to uh, get an importer in UK uh, or a distributor, which technically can be an importer as well. So what's what's yeah. your tip on, you know, how would they approach and what is your, you know, email marketing uh, idea? What is what does your title look like? What does your body of an email look like? What does your cold call phone look like? You know, give me some meat there. Well, for me, as you know, I would say as a sum and the things that I look for, um, I look for something pretty unique. So to, for me to serve something in a restaurant, it has to be something that I can get behind. And for me, I always and you know, it goes back to what I said before. Um, it's about having a story and about, you know, having a bit of provenance in within a product or, you know, um, a product that has a bit of story to it, at least. So what I look for is some A, something pretty unique, B, mm -hmm. something that not everybody's <laughs> heard about because then you're on the forefront of having something new and innovative um, and, you know, it's not something that you can get locally, I guess, um, but to something that has, I would probably say, the best ideas of something that's been created with a little bit of meaning, whether mm -hmm. that's wine and spirits or a beer, you know, everything has a story. So I look for that uniqueness in it. Price points are always a good thing to be to be talking about. And I don't think as a marketing tool, um, I don't think anybody should be shying away that even if you have an expensive product, if it's premium or, premium or not, you should have confidence within that. Mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a, you know an eight pound bottle of wine to a thirty pound bottle of wine at cost, you know why does it have that value? And you should mm -hmm. be adding to that as mm -hmm. as a, you know as an, a distributor or an importer. Now, the struggles I've had personally was when I first jumped onto the wine scene, especially in England. It was as soon as you're into um, you know a well established place, people were calling you up all the time, and they would give you a call. Oh, hey, I'm such a body from such a place. Can I come and see you? 
without anybody, you know, without any warming, so to speak, you would just get jumped upon. So mm -hmm. I found that interesting and a bit of a good insight where if you don't have any connection and someone's just code calling, then but why would you create that connection? There has to be something behind it. So for me, I think if you're an importer or a distributor, is a cold calling, albeit a good thing, it's always good to get face-to-face -face as well. I'm a firm believer of that. But if you're coming saying, oh, I hate, you know, this is a code call or however you decide to do it, the, I think there can be some structure to it. So we probably should touch on that, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So let's touch on that, you know, our process, right? So I mean, I'll give you uh, maybe my uh, headway so maybe you can understand where we are heading, right? So I would have uh, database uh, targets, like you constantly, let's build a database of, you know, 20 a week prospective importers and distributors. And I would warm email them, hey, you know, looking for a quick uh, hello chat on why, you know, I think my, my brand will be able to add value and what we'll do to make sure it adds value. And before I, I go into the storytelling, I would simply go that, give me a chance, you know, uh, allow me to explain that, uh, you know, I think I'm going to bring something to the table and uh, give you my logic to it, right? So I would look for that. Uh, and then I would, I would call that as a prospect, right? So I would have a target that, okay, maybe five a week, I at least need to have a meeting with on a video, because obviously we're talking about overseas here right now, let's say. And then I'll try to uh, make a, a six, once a six month market work trip where I'll just pull out my all my prospects and all the leads and then obviously try to have face to face as much as I can right now now that would be my sort of a macro level uh, a funnel process and then uh, the variable would be what I'm pitching you know what how I'm following up uh, who am I pitching uh, so uh, what, let, let's go there I mean what would your sales process look like for a complete new business dev for a new perspective I think um, I probably say obviously data harvesting is the first thing that we need to, to to focus on that's the most lengthy process when it comes down to um you know code calling fresh leads you know whatever you want to call it cold calls have a look at the product that they've got have a look at the yeah. data and once you've got the data and input it correctly you need to be very meticulous when it comes down to what data you're harvesting and why you're harvesting it. I think, yeah, when I said talk about harvesting, let's talk about the old fashioned manual way, whereas you go onto a website or you have a list, get on that list, get on the website, you get the phone number, you get the person of contact, you get the address details, website details, everything that you can find out about that company and put that in as in raw data in your, your customer relations, uh, your CRM program, if you will. And then do a little bit of research. It can take 30 seconds. It can take a minute. It can take five minutes. If you do a little bit of homework about the person you're about to call, rather than just being any random person, then you have a little bit of understanding of where they're coming from as well. That's that's what I personally would do anyway. Mm -hmm. So have, a, have an understanding of the, the, the company that you're calling rather than just picking up a phone and saying, hey, this is who I am. You mm -hmm. can say, hey, this is who I am. But you also have a little bit more knowledge if they start, you know, well, who are you? What do you want? Type of thing. Mm. Oh, True. well, you know, my name's Wayne Baxendale, so to speak. I work for London Competitions. I just noticed that you were uh, in the paper of X, Y, and Z, or I just saw your application mm. or your your publication in, you know, on YouTube or whatever it was. If you can say, sure. I found that really interesting and I wanted to speak more to you about it, doesn't that give you a little bit more substance than just, hey, this is what I'm doing, this is who I am? Therefore, you're showing a little bit more interest into the company that you call in. Mm. I think that is so, one of the most for, you know, you should be using that first thing off the bat for me. Got it. So on, on that itself, let's say uh, going back on uh, the database, right? So when you are searching uh, for wine importers in UK, let's say on Google, you know, uh, simple as that, right? So uh, what, what are some ways to build a good database? You know, so one is simply finding the companies. Now, which kind of companies, what we'll look for, you know, as we discussed, I think one of the things which I used to do was I used to find similar sort of companies for my wine brand, let's say my size, medium size wineries. I used to find uh, who uh, carries uh, them in UK. And then I used to find other companies and go to their distribution page again and find distributors listed under them in UK, right? So you know that it's pretty much the same uh, set of distributors which are into boutique wines and spirits, you know? And, and then I used to 
uh, uh, sometimes say that, hey, you carry, uh, you know, you, you carry uh, veins, uh, vineyards, and we're pretty much the same. I do understand that it's a similar sort of line, uh, but I do see that you don't have a Merlot and our Merlot is like top selling Merlot, uh, you know, uh, and you do carry Shiraz from Wayne, but I just wanted to talk about Merlot if there was an opportunity, you know, so some, some way, you know, uh, give it's me two or three ways to connect uh, the particular case of an importer or a distributor. Now, what kind of connections would you make? Like you made a wonderful example of, let's say competition and pitching a winery, but how would you connect importer and distributor? I think, for, but for me, and I, I, I'll be biased on it because I'm a huge fan of California wine. Mm -hmm. So, so let's let's I take an example are, that you are a California winery, uh, calling a UK importer. I would look at probably the regions and the subregions. And um, for argument's sake, let's say I'm up in Napa Valley and I want to get my wine to, you know, not so much London, but the UK as as general. Mm -hmm. Now, I would look at California wine importers, you know, see who who they've got and who they're distributing to. Now, the best thing to do is have a look at some of the big importers. You know, for argument's sake, I'm going to say Liberty, no, you know, nothing towards them or anything good or bad. And just using them as, a, as an example. Um, they are a quite a big California wine importer. They're not huge. But they have a bit of substance and they have, um, you know, some really nice brands. <laughs> now, I know I'm just going to use the region of Paso Robles. Um, they have Tablas Creek. Now, if I was looking for kind of a, a warmer climate wine, there's a lot more different characteristics to that style of wine. So if they're important to Liberty, then give Liberty a call and say, hey, I've got something that is similar style to a Paso Robles style Shiraz or you know, so on and so forth. My style is kind of the same. So I was wondering mm -hmm. if you'd be interested in tasting my wine because my wine is of similar statue. It has similar characteristics, similar, you know, aromas. Um, and I would use that route of using something that's, your product is similar to what the, they like and mm -hmm. what they would probably be more inclined to buy or purchase for their existing clients. Because let's face it, if people like, a style of wine they tend to stick to it especially in the uk so why not rub off the side of that and say it's of similar style similar you know characteristics mm. get it in front of them first true what about the profit story right like be very direct in saying uh that hey you know uh we offer amazing uh, support programs with the goal to grow your depletions you know so my as a supplier my number one goal is to make sure it sells so i would go i would just pitch that directly you know, and and I think uh, I can I can really be your uh, supplier, uh, which will really work hard for you. So I would I would go that direction more and more. So at least you know uh, I'm I'm not just competing apples and apples, but I can win the support game. You know. So what's what's your angle on when would you tell uh, the profit story? Like okay, maybe you can make more margins, or maybe I'll support you more in your first go itself, or. You know, what if you just don't get a reply? I mean, first of all, most people ignore those type of emails or all those type of calls. It's a little bit of being persistent and having a unique story that tends okay. to sell it. If your email does get ignored, then it's a great opportunity. You should never use that as, well, they're not interested. It's a fantastic opportunity to actually pick up the phone and actually mm. speak to them. And I think a lot of people, <laughs> when it comes to cold calling or outsourcing, is they don't really use that as an opportunity. They just tend to yeah. call it as a dead lead if you don't get one or two emails back. Whatever happened <laughs> to picking up the phone and actually calling somebody and having a yeah. conversation. Never use, you know, a dead email or, you know, someone's answered the phone as, as a dead lead. Just give it time and, you know, those things will prosper over if you make the extra effort. Mm. In terms of, the profit side, I think there's a lot of adaptations you can take onto it. Um, you know, as an importer, you want to have a good portfolio that's quite diverse. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm going to use Liberty again, who are quite big. They have the mm -hmm. distribution network, so to speak. So it depends what you want want as a brand. I was talking to um, Ava Pemper, who has she's a, a New Zealand winemaker from Croatia. Yep, and she doesn't really care for all the big shiny places she wants people to she wants her wine to be in the smaller locations um i go back to ali wines who's um, who i use for california she has weird and wonderful stuff 
And she's quite picky and choosy of where the wine goes. It's not a case about, you know, making money. It's about how it tells its story correctly, mm. if that makes any sense. True. It's all, yeah, you, you can chase the dollars and make as much money as you want. But if you've got no statute behind your product and, you know. So you, it, think, you think aligning uh, the partner with story is a much better approach? That, hey, I think we, we both <laughs> have great synergies for what craft we are into. I think so. Um, I think something always has a story. Unless you want to make, you know, a big fast buck on, you know, a big brand, which I don't think that resonates to most of the consumers these days. Although it does resonate to a lot of them, there are certain type of people you can put in brackets. But okay. I think once something has a bit more story, then it will hit home to the people who want to be who want to taste that product. Let's say we move to the stage where, all right, they say, all right, uh, send me some samples and I'll have a look, right? And they've <laughs> tasted the samples. Uh, you know that they tasted last Friday and today is Monday or Tuesday. Uh, what would be your approach? Like what kind of email uh, words you would use or what kind of phone call you would make now for asking for a close? If you've had a couple of cold emails from them, I would drop an email and use that as like a point of reference. If you... If you've tasted the wine on Friday, it's now Monday, drop an email Monday and say, hey, let's set up a call to chat about the wines. Don't just go in off the bat. Oh, what did you think? What did you think? Because mm. it's a, it's a Monday morning. I mean, for, for argument's sake, it's a, it's a bank holiday over here at the moment. So nobody's going to answer the phone here and nobody's going to read an email. But you don't know that. Mm. You know, you don't know that. So drop an email. Tell them when you're going to call rather than trying to cold call them. You say, hey, I will call you at 11 o'clock tomorrow. We can have a quick chat about the wines. That hmm. might make much more sense than saying, what did you think about the wines? And then just leaving it as that. Tell them you're going to call. Give them a time that they're going to call. So when they pick up the phone, they know what to expect. So when you ask them, what did you think about the wines? What are the three or four uh answers you think uh they would say you know and, and then how would you object them how would you overcome them Let, let's say you know if we do a role play all right let's say I, I've, I've told you yeah Wayne. you know uh it's not bad i mean we still need some more time to think so how would you go about it first of all is like what are your tasting notes on them what did you did you understand the complexity of it and if you didn't then let's explain or at least chat about why it was there or wasn't there what were the benefits were what were the what did you like what are the benefits <clears throat> we always used to use a, um, a phrase of features and benefits. Um, that's what, I mean, I, I, in the world of sales, it's quite common, but feature, is it dry? If, if that's mm. a feature of your wine or, you know, you've designed it that way or made the wine that way, should I say, then why did it, why is it complement to the drink? Mm. If that makes sense. And I, I keep talking about wine because that's my forte, but... Oh, did you notice the high tannins? Oh, yeah, the, the tannins were really crazy on that. So we made it in that style of tannins because we wanted to get X, Y, and Z across. And those things could be, um, we wanted high tannins because we wanted it to be a, you know, a, a food friendly. We were aiming at having this particular wine served with a steak, and that's why we did it. Now, mm. if you hadn't have told the person who was drinking that, they would have just gone, oh, my God, this is a Barolo. It's ridiculously dry. It's high in tannins. But if you explain why it's like that, then you're adding substance to the to the product. You know, let's go back on the same question. Like, what's your closing ask? Like, hey, Wayne, fantastic. Great to know that you loved it. Uh, what do you think would be the next steps uh, for us to get started? So that's my, my closing. How would you do it? I would say something on the lines of, well, hey, if you really, if you like the product that much, why don't we, uh, <clears throat> why don't we look at getting a couple of cases over? You can start with some of your smaller, you know, smaller guys. If anything, I know you're overseas, but I think it's always good to, to to connect. You have an importer. It's always good to connect the actual producer with the person who's on the floor, so to speak. Mm. Now, there's a lot of places who fall short on this, and I think it's a massive, massive bonus where if a winemaker is coming into my establishment where I'm serving the wine, Try and create something around that. And I know that everyone says that oh, it's industry involved, industry involved, or trade only, trade only. I understand why. But if I took any of my friends into, you know, a trade tasting, they would be absolutely blown away by it because they, they get insight to, to the industry where, you know, the general public don't. So mm. why don't people use that? Let's look into that a little bit. 
if you have a great product and you say, okay, this is a brand new product, how can we put the winemaker or <laughs> let's say a tasting session, like whether it's over Zoom or whatever, in front of the people who are actually consuming it? Now, th mm. that's a really good marketing technique, which not a lot of people use. Now, what I mean by that is, let's say we've got a brand new product in, I'm the owner of a wine bar, and I have 20 very consistent clients who want to have, who do wine tastings with me. Now, I would market that as, guys, I've got this very unique wine. We, we've only got the first 12 bottles that have been imported into the UK. Why don't we do a tasting with it? You put an email out, you tell mm -hmm. them, you get those people booked in, and those people are now going to have either a Zoom or a face-to-face -face and have a very unique experience Hmm. of tasting something that nobody else has ever had before hmm. that is very very powerful and sells beyond anything else that i've ever done before in terms of a wine bar nice because you're putting the product in front of somebody who's never had it before and is proud to say <clears throat> and tell all the mates that they've just had this beautiful wine tasting the winemaker came on zoom or the winemaker was there and it was blah 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 blah, blah. that is hmm. powerful very very mm. powerful rather than saying you know here's a 152 page book of wines that we've got from all over the world now that mm. as an importer and exporter it's great to have a big portfolio but if you can get your winemaker in and put your winemaker in front of consumers that is even more powerful so i think the connection of you know people who are closing sales left right and and they've got this accolade they've got that accolade is great but the human connection has been lost over the mm. years. And I think, I would say the past 18 months, it's become more powerful and stronger every single month. Whereas if you can sit down in front of a winemaker or someone who owns a winery or someone who's very high up here, you know, something to do with the winery speaks mm. way more volumes than anybody could ever even fathom these days. It just really is coming home to it. Anyway, a bit of a tangent, but it's Got very it. powerful. Uh, well, I'm sure. Uh, I think it's a great tip because again, you know, it, it's just easy to do this kind of thing sitting in a winery, you know, outside of UK. They don't have to travel well, as well, but you can add yeah, more value. Yeah, it is. And it's you know the the those six bottles that I, as a wine maker, have given to a distributor, and then that distributor's gone. Hey, why don't we do this? Hmm. put you in front of 20 people, those 20 people. Now, word of mouth is a big thing. And it's all very well, you know, when it comes down to, you know, um, I, I wouldn't say not so much spirits, beer or wine, because they aren't ad as, as advertised as much as everything else. Although, you know, you could say beer is. But those 20 people are then going to tell one or two of those of their friends hmm. that were in that same community of the same people you want to, to market to. Hmm. Those 20 people tell a further 20 people, you've now got 40 people and so on and so forth. And that's how it's going to grow because you've put hmm. it in front of the right people. And if you, you have to give every opportunity the same amount of energy, otherwise, you know, it's yeah. not going to work. You have to give it that energy. Let's go on uh, opening retail accounts, right? Uh, right? Like I'm talking about off trade here. So knocking doors, you know, in, in places like odd bins or big chains or you know, uh, mom and pop uh, bottle shop. So I, I want to go more on the mom and pop bottle shop because chains, we know it's a little hard to get, get the appointments and so on. When it comes to getting placements, uh, how would you approach, you know, this um, small bottle shops? Like, uh, you know, first of all, the problems that industry has is who is the decision maker and when do I meet you, right? So uh, that is a big problem, like including sommeliers and bartenders. But let's, let's stick to off-grade. The good old-fashioned way of, you know, especially what happens in London is you'll have, you know, a sales rep who walks around, gets his boots on the ground at 9 a.m. in the morning and doesn't stop till five, visiting as many places as humanly possible. Um, as much as that is, I think, a good way of doing it, because you have to put your, you, you know, your feet on the floor, you have to get your hands dirty. Um, it's something that I don't think I've got that much um experience into however i have had so many people you know although but i'm on trade but <laughs> i've had so many people come into me and go hey i've got this product let's crack it open and tell me what you think or the natural progression if i was owning a wine shop and someone came into me would be 
I don't have the time. It's a common, you know, objection that you always get that, oh, can you can you give me a call and let's book it in type of thing? And those things kind of get lost. Hmm. So for me, I think it's probably good to, again, go back to the basics of dropping an email, follow up on an email, give them a phone call. And if you once you've got them on the phone is then tell them, hey, don't ask for it. Just tell them, but be polite about it. But so, it's so hard to get retailers <laughs> on email or phone. You know, it's impossible to find their emails and next to impossible to get them on the phone because they are the ones sort of working the floor. It is. And that, that's where a lot of persistence comes into it. You've got it is difficult. It is very difficult. But I think one of the things, uh, again, I always go back to storytelling because it's one thing that I have found that works for me is if you can get somebody on the phone and then say, oh, hey, I, I need to speak to X, Y and Z. Oh, he's not busy at the moment. Can I take a message? Yeah, of course you can. My name is, you know, hmm. for argument's sake, Wayne Baxendale. I work for London Competitions. Just wanted to have a quick chat with about a publication that was went out and wanted to get his uh, experience on it. Hmm. Once you start building rapport, that rapport hmm. will be a benefit to you more than the product than anything else. Hmm. Your rapport with on-trade, off-trade, regardless of who it is, if you if you go in cold and it happens everywhere on trade and off trade is the nine times out of ten it's like oh for god's sake somebody trying to sell me something rather than someone just trying to be your buddy mm. you know that i think that is a very interesting approach to take because i think that works and has always worked for me in regardless mm. of any situation so so on that you know uh, <laughs> let's say if the goal was to be a buddy and to, to goal was to make a repo let's let's give some three or four places where they can do repo building right so one would be just going in stores and saying, I just want to came and come and see hello and just introduce myself, blah, blah, blah. That can be at scale. Uh, second can be trade show networkings, conferences. What 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 are some good things that you've seen where a, a good platform for rapport building can be done between buyers and sellers? Recent examples I would probably say came from, there's a wonderful little place over in Cheshire and it's called Defined Wine. Um, mm -hmm. For those who know it, those who don't, it's a wonderful place. It should be Michelin starred. You know, it's a great little place. It's owned by a gentleman called John. Mm -hmm. Now, John is a WSET uh, educator. So he is level three or diploma. Um, I'm not too sure of his, uh, of his level. But he does a, his own little wine classes. He's got his own little bottle shop. He then decided to open up a restaurant. He's got a cheese shop. His place mm -hmm. is absolutely wonderful. Now, I've been in there before as a buy, as, you know, as a, a, a consumer, and walked in and gone, this place is absolutely insane. It's really, really nice. So I was fortunate enough to be on the floor in the shop where the owner was present. And I've gone, this is a wonderful shop. Who owns it? Oh, hmm. I do. Well, what's your name? John, blah, 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 blah. And we've, we, you know, we've kept a, a couple of emails going back and forth. But, you know, it's one of those where I've gone in, I've never wanted to buy something straight away, but I've introduced myself. He knows who I am. I know what his face looks like, vice versa. Um, and he is 45 minutes away from my house. But I will go out of my way 45 minutes to go to that mm. shop because it's a wonderful wine shop. He's got wonderful wine. Now, even if my situation has changed and I become a wine buyer, at least he knows who I am and what I'm doing. You connect with on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is such a powerful tool. Mm. And if you're not using it, quite frankly, you should be. And I use that a lot. And that's where a lot of applications come in, a lot of publications come in, a lot of, you know, honourable mentions where somebody's been to some place and they've tagged Defined Wine in and said, this place is wonderful, you know, to eat, and then you comment on it. And that flow of constantly seeing your name or your face mm. um, really, I think, works tremendously well in the industry rather than just, you know, the, the, so, the, the cold call, so to speak. We'll refer to mm. it as cold call. But if somebody Agreed. knows... <clears throat> who I am, what I've been doing over the past 18 months. Oh, yes, it's not instant gratification straight away, but then you're slowly building rapport that is mm -hmm. more valuable to them than mm -hmm. it is to, as much as it is to you. But they'll turn around and say, do you know what? When you've been, you know, I will think that I've seen this guy, he's been on the radar, he's been on LinkedIn, he's been into the shop a few times. I'm just curious now to know, just to try and find out what he's doing. 
that is that's the key that you've you've made it you've broken the, the I chain think, it's i think the problem although it's is, a longer process it's true you, that, you can't that, that's a, if you're in it for a quick buck it ain't gonna work you need yeah, to that's be exactly where i was term. going to go where for a one case of placement you're asking a lot of investment you know uh from a supplier to to and, and we've all done it right we've all uh, bought a drink at a bar just to create a rapport for a bartender or had a, a meal at a restaurant just to create a rapport with the sommelier but this is like real a lot of money just for six bottle order it, it is but then if you look at the report you look at your six bottle order your six bottle then be turned into do you know what i met this guy yeah. he's really good let's turn that six into 12 that 12 turns into 24 and then it just becomes a bigger do, do and more prospect. Do you have suppliers ask once they've nailed it, right? Once you know that you can bet on me, I'm a great supplier. My brands are working on your store. You know, uh, have you had people ask, hey, Wayne, you know, uh, do you, can you recommend me three or four bars? I could go and uh, sell my wine as well or tell your buddies to just make an appointment with me. What's the <laughs> referral? <laughs> I get that all the time, all the time. Do you do it? Or and you bad? know what? For me, I no, I think it's a good thing because uh, yeah, it's you're gonna annoy everybody else, but I, who I am and what I do and what I've been, you know, where I've come from and what I stand for, it annoys everybody else because <laughs> because I don't just stick to one supplier. I I go to quite a few. Yeah. Now you know, I could be throwing a spanner in the works here, but you know, I've. There's probably, I would say, 10 different importers who I use and uh, who I buy from for my clients personally, because each importer has something unique to offer. And, mm. you know, I'll use one big uh, wine supplier in the country. I'm not going to name names, but you could use one person, then you're limited to what the capabilities are, where I use three or four off the top of my head because I know that their products are awesome. And mm. I, I've for, been fortunate enough to be in Pasadena, Robles, for argument's sake. I've been to California. I've been to, you know, Tuscany. I've been to Rioja. I've been to Portugal. Mm -hmm. So I have my favorite people, uh, favorite wineries, because I like that style of wine. Mm -hmm. So I import from different people. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, once one distributor is going to supply you with everything, I think you, as a... As a buyer, as a, a business owner, you should be looking not just at one, but at quite a few because you mm -hmm. don't know what's around the corner. You mm -hmm. don't know what's new. If you're going to stick to one supplier, then you're bound, you, you stick into one narrative. Mm -hmm. When there's so many different personalities and different opinions out there, why are you just sticking to one? That would be my personal point of view. But I, I supply tons of different people and not just aiming my product or my services at one particular group. Mine's quite vast. So it can Got be it. quite personal and can be, you know, if, you, if you're looking to have different clientele, then have different products from different people rather than just yeah. one narrative. Let's have some objection handling thing where I'm throwing an objection and you can just answer me, right? So we're going to act like a role player. You're, you're selling and I'm the buyer here. I'm the retail buyer. So uh, Wayne, uh, I don't have much time right now. I'm just uh, in the middle of you know serving this customer. Okay, perfect. What I'll do is I'll drop you an email and we'll find a time in a couple of weeks where we can make it accessible for both of us. We don't sell much Australian wines, you know, uh, wine, uh, uh, our category is slow for Australia. So why don't we have a look at doing a tasting? You can advertise it to uh, your customers and we can start educating people in the local area about what benefits uh, Australian wine has to offer. I'm not the decision maker. You know, it's a complete bullcrap one, as we all know, right? So <laughs> I, I'm, not the, I, I'm not the decision maker. Um, well, perfect. If you can give me the name and number or email, at least I can have a chat with the people who do. Money is tight, you know. Uh, what's your credit term? I would suggest we probably sit down and have a look through the portfolio and see what uh, profits or what uh, prices are good for you and your clients. Uh, one of the things I think which I see often is they simply saying, all right, you know what? Uh, come back next week and we'll, we'll taste it. Or uh, come back next week and remind me. Okay, so uh, that's a good one, actually. So I would use that as absolutely nailing somebody down. Um, I know we kind of touched on that at the beginning. <clears throat> if someone says, oh, come and see me next week and we'll have a bit more of a chat about it. Okay, get a pen, get your notepad out. You should always have one local. Get your pen and say, right, what time is best for you? Put the hmm. ball back in their court. The amount of times I've had somebody say, oh, now's not a good time. 
great. Tell me when is. Mm. If you're not direct, people aren't going to take you seriously. Now it's not a case of being direct. You can you can be direct and come across as a bit arrogant. It's you say it with a smile on your face. Okay, sure. perfect. So I'm free at um, next Thursday. Is Thursday good for you? They're either going to say yes or no. Yes, next Thursday. Mm. Okay, eleven o'clock. Good for you. Uh, yes, perfect. Done. Uh, now I've tasted the wines. Everything's good, and I'm and I'm going to say. Yeah, it's all good, Wayne, but I'm just not sure yet. Well, tell me what it is you're unsure about and see if we can uh, right the wrongs. I need some more time to think. Okay, so when would you like to book a call in for next Wednesday? Mm -hmm. And then you're going back to having those positive affirmations. Mm -hmm. Give give them, don't say, oh, is next week okay? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Give them days, give them times, because if these people are having difficulty making time or having time to think about it then give them the time but be specific about it mm. one of the things that have always especially with the you know high-end luxury sales is people often forget to ask for the sale or ask for time giving open questions is good in a way but sometimes they need to be closed questions or closed answers now an open question for those who don't necessarily follow that an open question is, you know, having something that have making sure that the response is quite vast, whereas mm. the closed question is a yes or a no. So, do we? I when we were on the ship, we always use feel, felt, found the, the the three Fs that we would use in storytelling. Now, I'm going into divulging yeah. into into the sales a little bit. Um, feel, felt, found is something that you can always use. Um, I feel that um, you know the products are very nice, and I've well felt over time is that when we've given customers a little bit more time to think about it, and we found that they come back with us in you know within about a week. So is Wednesday good? So you mm. use it seamlessly, and um, that's a you could use open ended questions. A closed question is so um, Wednesday is good for you, yeah? Mm. Do you just say yes yeah. or no? That's a closed question. Got yes, it. Wednesday. Okay, so we got Wednesday. Um, 11 or 12, that's a, a kind of an open, closed question. Yep. Don't say what time is good for you, because yep. they say never is a good time. <laughs> you say, True. I'm free at 1 o'clock or 5 o'clock, which is best for mm. you. They, then give them an option of one or the other. It's not a yes or a no. They're committed because they've already said yes and free on Wednesday, so you're free at 1 o'clock on Wednesday. Done. Put it in the diary, email invitation for a calendar meet, job done what, what what is the you know as we say in sales like get the first uh the first uh should be sort of a, a close end question where the answer is yes right so you get small right. yeses into a big yes so let's let's end it up let's wrap it up with one final first question that you would want to ask a bottle shop you know where you're going to get a yes like what would you frame that as a as a you know getting a yes i always use three yes three yeses so you could use your feel felt found. Um, I always have three yeses. They're going to say yes to at least two of the following. Do you like the product? Is it something that you can see yourself drinking? And would you be committed to buying it? Now, you could use that as however you want to interpret it, or you can you know, manipulate that in however shape or form of any sales pitch. So do you like the product, Sid? Not sure yet. So you need more time? Yes. So what is Wednesday good for you at one o'clock? I'm free then. Yes, got it. So there's one scenario where you've just objected and just overcome it. Mm. So we'll start again. Sid, do you like the product? It's great wine, right? Yes. Perfect. It's not bad. Um, So could you you see yourself uh, purchasing a few more, let's say, Let's see if you take two cases from us, 12 bottles. Is that all right? Uh, yes, can, but I have to still check uh, before committing. Okay, what do you need to check on? Is there anything you need to run over now? Mm, yeah, you know what? I think let's give it a try, six bottles. There you go. Yeah. So the, so you've gone from your feel felt found and your three yeses. So <clears throat> if you want to object on one of them, let's go from there. So, Sid, I, I absolutely love this wine. It's uh, Wayne's wine from... Um, Napa Valley. Did you like the product? No, I did not like that much. Oh, per- well, interesting. What didn't you like about the product? 
I think the price it's a little uh, expensive for our our place. Okay, so if we could uh, maybe make a move on the price, it's currently priced at fifteen pounds nine. Um, what price are we looking at to make this more affordable for you to take some bottles today? I think if I can make forty percent and you know uh, retail under nineteen ninety nine. Okay, so perfect. maybe 12, 12, 12 pounds or something like that. So if I could get that to maybe 13, 25, is that something we could probably meet halfway on? Sure. There you go. Got it. Mm. So the cool. yes, is the, yes, you like the product. No, the price is, isn't that good. But yes, you're willing to spend a little bit less mm. to get the product in. What what I liked in your approach is, you know, you have to be so fast and confident in handling an objection uh, that you're there to serve them and solve their problem, but in a super confident way, immediately. Yeah, I think it's one of those you need to, especially in, you know, the world of wine, there's a lot of, um, I, not so much wine, but definitely it's probably the, the, the hospitality industry full stop. <clears throat> and in the sales industry, there's a lot of, what can be perceived as arrogance mm, um, can be come across as being overcommitted. And, you know, it, for me, if you don't have the quickness and the knowledge and the understanding to, to back it up, then, you know, it, you, you're breaking down your own sales process. Mm. So have that confidence. Have the, you know, obviously a lot of this does come with a lot of, you know, experience and a lot of knowledge, but, the more you role play, especially in the higher end of sales, doesn't make a difference if it's 30. I've sold a 30,000 pound emerald ring on a cruise ship when someone was on a vacation. But yeah, I can't sell someone a 15 pound bottle of wine. So mm. there's so many different things in between where, you know, you, you don't come across as arrogant. Just come across with a little bit of a little bit of confidence, a bit of a chip on your shoulder. But having the confidence to know that what you've got your products <laughs> now as a winery or as a distributor you can use them in any way shape or form you've got something to overcome it just mm. by having a bit of experience and understanding what the process is